Hello, good afternoon. Um, does anyone actually get the reference in my title? Like, I see like two or three. Yes, so it's a re reference to a really awesome book, Thinking Fast and Slow. I highly recommend it. No relation to this actual like talk though. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Lynn Root. Um, I am a site reliability engineer at Spotify. Um, I also do a lot of um, open source evangelism internally. Um, and you might know me from uh, PyLadies as well. Um, also, unfortunately, I'm going to take up like the whole time. Um, so if you have questions or want to chat, um, you can come join me for a convenient coffee break right after this. Uh, okay, another quick question. Has anyone read uh, the Site Reliability Engineering book, aka the Google SRE book? Uh, I think I see a few hands. All right, well, I highly recommend that book, um, but the TLDR of like every chapter seems to be use distributed tracing. Um, so with the pre prevalence of uh, microservices, um, where you may or may not own all the services that a request might flow through, um, it's certainly imperative to understand where your code fits into the grand scheme of things um, and how um, everything operates with each other. So there's three main needs to trace a system. Uh, performance debugging, uh, capacity planning, um, and problem diagnosis, um, although it can help address many other issues as well. So um, while this talk will have like a slight focus towards uh, performance debugging, uh, these techniques can certainly be applicable to other needs. So I have a bit of a jam-packed day today. Um, I'll start off with an overview um, of what tracing is and the problems we can try to diagnose with it. And I'll also talk about some general types of tracing we can use and what key things to think about when scaling up to larger distributed systems. Um, and then the inspiration for this talk stemmed from me trying to improve the performance of um, one of my own team's services, um, which sort of implies we don't really trace at Spotify. Um, so I'll be running through some questions to ask and approaches to take when diagnosing and fixing um, your service's bottleneck. And finally, I'll wrap up with some um, tracing solutions uh, for uh, profiling performance. Um, and as I mentioned before, I won't have time for questions, so you can catch me right out there. All right. Um, in the simplest of terms, um, a trace follows the complete workflow um, from the start of a transaction or a request um, to its end, um, including the components that it flows through. So for a very simple web application, um, it's pretty easy to understand uh, the workflow of a request, um, but then add some databases, um, separate the front end from the back end, maybe throw in some caching, have an external API call, all behind a load balancer, then scale up to tens, hundreds, or thousands of times, it gets kind of difficult to put together workflows of requests. So historically, we've been focused on machine-centric metrics, um, including system-level metrics like CPU, disk space, and memory, as well as app-level metrics like request per second, response latency, database writes, et cetera. Um, following and understanding these metrics are quite important, uh, but there's no view into a service's dependencies or its dependence. Um, it's, not, it's also not possible to get a view of a complete flow of a request nor develop an understanding of how one's service performs at scale. So a workflow-centric approach allows us to understand relationships of components within an entire system. And then we can follow a request from beginning to end to understand bottlenecks, um, hone in on the anomalistic paths, um, and figure out where we need to add more resources. So when looking at a very simplified system where we have a load balancer, a front end, back end, database, maybe an external dependency to a third party API, and when we have redundant systems, it gets particularly confusing to follow a request. So um, how do we debug a program um, of a rare workflow? Um, how do we know which component of this system is the bottleneck? Which function call is taking the longest? Is there another app on my house causing distortion of machine-centric metrics, or performance metrics, something like the noisy neighbors problem? So with so many potential paths that a request can take with potential for issues at each and every node and edge, um, this can be mind-numbingly difficult um, if we continue to be machine-centric. Uh, so end-to-end -end tracing uh, will allow us to get a bigger picture um, of, uh, uh, to address these concerns. Um, and looking at the magnitudes of what we're op operating at Spotify, um, you can see that tracing, if we did it, would help us a lot. Oh, um, so real quickly, um, there are a few reasons why we trace the system. Uh, the one that inspired this talk is performance analysis, 
Um, this is trying to understand what happens at the 50th or 75th percentile, the steady state problems. Um, and this will help us identify latencies, uh, resource usages, um, and other performance issues. Um, we are also able to understand questions like, did this particular deploy of the service have an effect on latency of the overall whole system? Um, tracing can also clue us in on anomalistic uh, request flows, the 99.9 .9 percentile. Um, the issues can still be related to performance, or it can help identify problems with correctness, like component failures or timeouts. Um, profiling is very similar to the first, uh, but here we're just interested in particular components or aspects of system. Um, we don't necessarily care about the, f the full workflow here. The fourth one, we can also answer questions of uh, what a particular uh, component depends on um, and what depends on it. Um, particularly useful for a complex system, uh, complex systems. Um, so when, um, with dependence, dependence identified, we can also att attribute particularly expensive work, uh, like component A adds significant workload with disk writes to component B, um, so which can help be helpful when attributing costs to teams and service owners or component owner owners. And then finally, uh, we're able to create models of our entire systems that allow us to ask uh, what if questions, uh, like what would happen to component A if we did a disaster recovery test on component B. So there are varying, uh, various approaches to tracing. Um, I'll only highlight three of them here. The first is, is manual, it's also very simplistic, um, where you are just generating your own trace IDs um, and adding them to your logs. Um, and there are very simple things that can be added to your web service here. Um, especially ones that uh, do not have dependent or depending components that you don't have access to. Um, you won't get any pretty visualizations or, or help with centralized collection um, beyond what we typically have uh, with your logs, but it still can provide insight. So this is um, a Flask example, super simple, um, using a decorator. Here you can simply add a UUID to each request um, um, received as a header, then log uh, at particular points of interest. Um, like at the beginning and end of, of a request, and then any other in-between components or function calls um, where you want to propagate headers. And this is exactly what I ended up doing for my service, which made me wish for a better way, hence this talk. Um, I must admit I do a lot of conference-driven development. Um, so if your app is behind Nginx you're, that you're able to manipulate, you can also turn on its ability to stamp um, each request with a re X request ID header, as you see here with the add header and proxy set header. You can also add a very uh, simple, like you can simply add the request ID to Nginx's logs as well. Um, next up is black box tracing. This is tracing with no implementation across the components. Um, it tries to infer the workflows and relationships by correlating variables and timing within already defined uh, log messages. Uh, so from here, uh, relationship, relationship inference is done via statistical or regressional analysis. And it's, this is easiest with uh, centralized logging, and if there's somewhat of a standardized schema to log messages that contain like an ID or a timestamp. Um, it's particularly useful if instrumenting an entire system is too cumbersome. Um, or you can't otherwise instrument components that you don't own. And as such, it's quite portable, um, and there's very little to, to no overhead, but it does require a lot of data points in order to in correctly infer relationships. Um, it also lacks accuracy with the absence of instrumenting components themselves, as well as the ability to attribute causality with asynchronous behavior and concurrency. Another uh, approach to uh, black box tracing can be through network tapping using SFlow or NFDump or uh, IP uh, table packet data, uh, which I am sure the NSA is quite familiar with themselves. Um, and then the final type of tracing is through uh, metadata prop uh, propagation. And this approach was made popular by Google's uh, research paper on Dapper. And so components are instrumented at particular trace points uh, to follow causality between functions, components, and systems, or, or even with common RPC libraries like gRPC, and that will automatically add metadata to each call. So metadata that is tracked includes um, a trace ID, which represents one single trace or workflow, and a span ID for um, each and every point in a particular trace, like a request sent from client, a request received by server, server responds. 
and then the uh, spans start and end time. So this approach works best when the system itself is designed with tracing in mind, um, but not many people do that, right? <laughs> so this avoids um, guesswork with the uh, inferring causal relationships. However, it can add a bit of overhead uh, to response time and throughput. So the use of uh, sampling traces um, limits the burden here on the system um, and the data point storage. Um, sampling anywhere between 0.01% and 10% of requests is often plenty to get an understanding of a system's performance. Uh, so when starting to have many microservices um, and scaling out with many more resources, um, there are a few points to keep in mind when instrumenting your system, particularly with the metadata propagation approach. Um, so in terms of what to keep in mind, and I'll go into detail about each in a second, um, we want to know what relationships to track, uh, essentially how to follow a trace and what is considered part of a workflow, um, how they are tracked. Um, constructing metadata to track causal relationships is particularly difficult. Um, there are a few approaches, each with their own fortes and drawbacks. And then how to reduce overhead of tracking. Um, the approach one chooses in sampling is largely defined by what questions you're trying to answer um, with your tracing. And then there may be a clear answer, but not without its own penalties. And finally, how to visualize. Um, the visualizations needed um, will also be informed by what you're trying to answer with tracing. All right, so uh, what to track. Um, when looking within a request, um, we can take two points of view, either the submitter point of view or the trigger point of view. Um, so the submitter point of view um, follows or just focuses on one complete request uh, and doesn't take into account if part of that request is caused by another request or action. So for instance, the evicting cache uh, here uh, that was actually triggered by request two is still attributed to request one since its data comes from the first request. Uh, the trigger point of view uh, focuses on the trigger that initiates the action. Uh, we're in the, in the same example, uh, request two evicts cache from request one, and therefore the eviction is included in request two's trace. So choosing which to follow depends on the answers that you're trying to find. Uh, for instance, it doesn't really matter which approach is chosen for performance profiling, uh, but following trigger causality will help detect um, anomalies by showing critical paths. All right, um, how to track, or essentially what is needed in your metadata. This essentially boils down to, um, it's, it's very difficult to reliably track causal relationships within a distributed system. Now, the sheer nature of a distributed system implies issues with ordering events and traces that happen across many hosts. Um, and there might not be a global synchronous clock available, so care must be taken when deciding what goes into crafting the metadata that is threaded through um, an end-to-end -end trace. So using a random ID like UUID or the um, X request ID header um, will identify caus causal related activity, but then tracing implementations um, must use some sort of external clock to collect uh, traces. Um, and then in the absence of a global synchronized clock um, or to avoid issues like clock skew, um, looking at network send and receive messages can um, then be used to construct causal relationships. Um, because you can't exactly uh, receive a message before it's sent. Um, and a lot of tracing implementations use this uh, very simplistic approach. However, this approach um, lacks resili resiliency. Um, there's a potential for data loss uh, from external systems or inability to add trace points to uh, components that's owned by others. Um, tracing systems can also add a timestamp derived from a local logical clock um, to the workflow ID where this isn't exactly the local system timestamp, but either a counter or sort of a randomized timestamp that is paired with a trace message. Um, so with this approach, we don't need uh, the tracing system to spend time on the ordering um, of traces it collects since it's explicit in the clock data, but parallelization and concurrency can complicate understanding these relationships. Um, and then one can also add the previous um, trace points that have been already executed within the metadata itself to understand all the forks and joins. Um, it also allows immediate availability of the tracing data itself as soon as the workflow ends, because there's no need to spend time on, on, on collating or establishing um, the order of causal relationships. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, metadata will only grow in size as it uh, follows the workflow, adding to the payload. 
Um, so it basically boils down to this. If you really care about payload of requests, then a simple unique ID is your go-to, um, but at the expense of needing to infer relationships. You can then add a time, a time stamp of sorts to help establish explicit causal relationships, um, but you're still susceptible to potential ordering issues of traces if data is lost. Uh, you may add the previously executed trace points to avoid data loss and understand the forks and joins of a trace um, while um, gaining immediate availability of trace data since causal relationships are already established, but then you um, suffer in payload size. And then there's also the fact that there are no op or open source tracing system that actually implement this last one. Um, so end-to-end -end tracing will have an effect on uh, runtime and storage um, overhead no matter what you choose. Um, for instance, um, if Google were to trace all web uh, searches despite its um, intelligent tracing implementation, um, it would impose a 1.5% throughput penalty and add 16% um, to the response time. Um, I won't go into very much detail, but there are essentially three basic um, approaches to uh, sampling. First is um, head-based. Um, which will make a random sampling decision at the start of a workflow and then will follow, away, follow it all the way through to completion. The next one is tail base, um, which will make the sampling decision at the end of the workflow, implying some caching going on here. Um, tail base sampling uh, needs to be a little bit more intelligent, um, but is particularly useful for uh, tracing anomalistic behavior. And finally, um, unitary sampling where the sampling decision is made at the trace point itself and therefore prevents the construction of a full uh, workflow. Um, so head-based is the simplest and probably most ideal for performance profiling, and both head-based and unitary are, are most often seen in current tracing implementations. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if um, there's a tracing system that actually implements tail-based. All right. Uh, what visualizations you choose to, um, to look at depends upon what you're trying to figure out. So um, Gantt charts are, are popular and definitely quite appealing, but it only shows requests from a single trace. Um, and you, can, you definitely have seen this type before if you looked at the network tab of your uh, browser's dev tools. Um, when trying to get a sense of where um, the system's bottlenecks are, a request flow graph, aka a directed acyclic graph, um, will, uh, will show workflows as they are executed, and unlike Gantt charts, can aggregate information of multiple requests um, of the same workflow. Um, another useful representation is a calling context tree in order to visualize multiple requests of different workflows, um, and this reveals both valid and invalid paths that a request can take, um, best for creating a general understanding of system behavior. So what the takeaway here is, um, there's a few things um, we need to consider when we trace a system. Um, you should have an understanding of what you want to do, what questions you're trying to answer with tracing. And um, certainly there will be other realizations and questions that come from a trace system. For example, with Dapper, um, Google is able to audit systems for security, um, asserting that only authorized components are talking to sensitive services. Uh, but not without understanding uh, what you're trying to figure out, um, you may end up approaching your instrumentation incorrectly. Uh, the answer to this question um, will help identify the approach um, to causality, whether um, from the trigger point of view or from submitter point of view. And then another important question, how much time do you want to put into instrumenting your system? Or can you even instrument all parts? Uh, this will inform the approach that you use to tracing, be it black box or not. Um, if you can instrument like all the things, or at least some of it, um, it then becomes a question of what data um, you should propagate through an entire work, uh, through entire flow. And finally, how much of the flows do you want to understand? Do you want to understand all the requests? Um, then you should be prepared to take a performance penalty on the service itself, um, and then you can have fun storing all that data. Um, or is a percentage of the flows okay? And then if so, uh, then how do we approach sampling? Um, and that's in your answer of what we want to know um, question. So for understanding performance, head-based sampling is, is certainly fine. You also need to think about whether or not you want to capture the full workflow um, of a request or only focus on a subset of the system. And then this will also inform um, your sampling approach, be it unitary or not. And so in, in terms of performance uh, and understanding where bottlenecks are, um, 
uh, you, you want to try and, and preserve the trigger causality rather than submitter, as it shows like the critical path to that bottleneck. Um, Head-based sampling is fine, as we don't need intelligent um, sampling, and even with very low sample rates, we can get a good idea of where our problem lies, um, since we um, essentially care about the 50th or 75th percentile. And finally, a request flow graph here um, is ideal, since we um, don't care about uh, anomalistic behavior. Uh, we want um, information of the, like, the big picture rather than looking into particular individual uh, workflows. Um, and so most often, once you are tracing a system, the problem will reveal itself, as will um, the solution, uh, but not always. So um, I do have a few questions to ask yourself uh, when figuring out how to improve um, a service's performance. First one is, um, are you making multiple requests to the same service? Um, round trip um, network calls are expensive, um, and perhaps there is a way to set up um, batch requests or accept batch requests on your end. Um, perhaps your service doesn't need to be um, synchronous or it unnecessary, unnecessarily blocks. Um, for example, if you're um, some big social networking site, um, can you grab a user's profile photo at the same time that you pull up their timeline while you try and grab their messages at the same time? Um, is the same data being repeatedly requested um, but not cached? Or maybe you are caching too much or maybe not the right data? Um, is the expiration uh, too high or too low? Um, what about your site's assets? Um, could, there be, um, could they be better or, um, ordered to improve loading time? Can you minimize the amount of inline scripts or maybe make your scripts async? Um, are there a lot of distinct domain lookups that add time to, uh, with uh, DNS responses? Um, and the, how about decreasing the number of actual files referenced um, or maybe minify and compress them? Um, there's a bunch of stuff that can be done with the front end part. Um, and then finally, perhaps you can use chunked encoding when returning large amounts of data. Um, are you otherwise able to have your servers produce elements of response as they are needed, rather than trying to produce all elements as fast as possible? All right, now probably the most interesting part. Um, so uh, about uh, current tracing systems that are out there. So there is um, an open standard for distributed tracing, allowing developers to instrument their code without vendor lock-in. Um, and they do this by standardizing the trace span API. Um, one criticism I have of open tracing is that they don't prescribe a way to implement more intelligent sampling other than a simple percentage and setting priority. Uh, there's also a lack of standardization for how to track relationships, uh, whether submitter or trigger. Um, it's pretty much all submitter. And um, it's mainly just a standardization for managing the span itself. Um, but mind you, it's a very young specification that's evolving and developing as we speak. Uh, there are a few um, self-hosted popular solutions um, that do support the open tracing specification. Um, probably the most widely used is Zipkin from Twitter, which has implementations in uh, Java, Go, JavaScript, Ruby, and Scala. Um, the architecture setup is basically the instrumented app sends data out of band to a remote collector um, that accepts a few different transport mechanisms, including HTTP, Kafka, and Scribe. So with propagating data from a service, um, all of the current uh, Python libraries only support HTTP. There's no RPC support. Um, and Zipkin does provide a, a nice Gantt chart or waterfall chart of individual traces. And you can see, um, you can view a tree of dependencies, but it's essentially only a tree with no information um, like latencies or status codes or anything else. Um, using PyZipkin, on which other libraries are based, you can define a transport mechanism, like I did here with HTTP transport, uh, which is, can be just simply posting um, a, a request with the content of the trace. Um, you can otherwise make one for Kafka or Describe. But then, otherwise, it's just a simple context manager um, being placed wherever you want to trace. Um, Eager is another self-hosted system that supports open tracing specification. Um, it comes from Uber. Um, rather than the application or client library reporting to a remote collector, um, it reports to a local um, agent um, via UDP, uh, who then sends out traces to a collector. Um, unlike Zipkin, which supports uh, Kafka and uh, Elasticsearch and uh, MySQL, uh, Jaeger only supports Cassandra for its storage. 
the UI is uh, very similar to Zipkin with uh, really pretty uh, waterfall graphs and a dependency tree. But again, nothing to help aggregate that performance information we're interested in. Uh, their documentation is also horribly lacking, unfortunately, but they do have a pretty decent tutorial to walk through. Um, the, their client library uh, for Python is, is a bit cringeworthy. Um, so this is a, a trimmed example from their docs, um, just me meaning to give the gist here. Um, basically, you can initialize a tracer um, that the open source or that the open tracing Python library will use and create a span and a child span with context managers. Um, but their usage at the end of time.sleep for yielding to IO, IO loop is a bit of a head scratcher. Um, its docs also make mention of supporting monkey patching libraries like requests and Redis and URLib2. So um, all I can say is use at your own risk. Uh, after I presented this at PyCon um, a couple months ago, um, the, like the day after they created an issue um, and basically made a comment in their code reasoning why, but I, I, I still don't get why. Um, so there are a couple others I, I'm not familiar, that familiar with, um, including AppDash and LightStep. Um, and there are um, a few more that don't have uh, Python client libraries yet. Um, and in case you don't want to host your own system, there are a few services out there to help. Um, there's Stackdriver Trace from Google, not to be confused with Stackdriver Logging. So um, unfortunately, Google has no uh, Python or gRPC client libraries to instrument your app with, um, but they do have a REST and RPC interface if you feel so inclined. Um, but they uh, do support uh, Zipkin traces where you can set up a Google-flavored Zipkin server either on their infrastructure or on yours and have it forward traces to um, Stackdriver. And they actually make it pretty easy, pretty easy. I was able to spin up a Docker image and start viewing traces within a couple minutes. Um, annoyingly, they have a storage limitation of 30 days, uh, same with their logging. Um, and uh, my last criticism of, is their UI. Um, they have simple plots of response time over the past few hours and a list of all traces that are automatically provided in the UI, but you have to like manually make analysis reports for each time period that you're interested in to get all the fancy distribution graphs. They're not automatically generated, unfortunately. Um, and then finally, Amazon also has a tracing service available called X-Ray. Um, I only set up the, their demo app, but um, it looks like they do not explicitly support Python, um, only no Java and .NET apps. Um, but the Python SDK, um, Botto, um, has support for sending traces to a local daemon, uh, which then forwards to the um, X-Ray service. And what's nice about X-Ray, despite it being proprietary and not open tracing compliant, um, is you're able to configure sampling rates for different URL routes um, of your application based on either fixed requests per second or a percentage of requests. However, it's not um, possible to configure um, these rules with bottom. Uh, also, uh, or almost redeemable, um, is their visualizations. Um, so while there's the typical waterfall chart, they also have a request flow graph that, um, where you can see average latencies, um, captured traces per minute, and requests broken down um, by response status. Um, so basically, um, AWS and X-Ray seems pretty cool and probably the most useful out of all of these, um, but it'll take some time instrumenting your app and introduces vendor lock-in. Um, and some honorable mentions that do app performance measurement. Um, I don't have um, personal experience with these, but um, Datadog and New Relic um, might be of interest to some of you. All right, and a quick opinionated wrap-up. Got like a minute here. If you run microservices, um, you should be tracing them. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to understand an entire system's performance, um, anomalistic behavior, resource usage, um, among other many aspects. However, good luck. Um, whether you choose a self-hosted solution or a provided service, documentation is all around lacking. Uh, granted, very young space, very much growing as open tracing standards, uh, standard is developing. Um, and as I mentioned, language support isn't 100% even if in, it might not even be there. And there's a lack of configuration for relationship tracking or intelligent sampling um, and um, available uh, visualizations. But um, it is indeed an open spec um, that can be influenced or you uh, might feel so inclined to implement your own, to which I say good luck. And then finally, all of this and, and some pretty graphs and stuff is, is up on my uh, blog post if you're, if you're interested. Um, thank you. <laughs>